Hello, everyone. Welcome to the July NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar from the offices of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. I'm excited to present this teleconference with our guest speakers, Andrea Jones and Timothy Glotch from NASA's International Observe the Moon Night Program. They'll share with us how you can get involved with coordinating your own local event, as well as how recent NASA missions have changed the way we view our closest celestial neighbor. But first, here's Vivian with a few things to share with everyone. Hi, everybody out there in webinar land. Um, it's good to see you. I am the manager of the NASA Night Sky Network, if I haven't met you already. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that we're working right now to update all the club content contact information. And if you could just take a quick look at your club and how it's represented on the Night Sky Network um, and make sure that all the information is up to date, I would really appreciate that. And it will help um, as we start to get the word out, especially around the eclipse next year. Um, and we want to make sure that people can know where to find you between here and there. Also, I just had a grand idea about 10 minutes ago, and in honor of International Observe the Moon Night, I want to have a giveaway. And so here's what I was thinking. Anybody who posts an event that's going to be held between October 1st and 15th, so the official date for International Observe the Moon date is the 8th, but we're going we're gonna to give you a broad range of dates where you can hold a moon event. So Post an event held anywhere between the 1st and the 15th that has the word moon in it, and you will be entered in a lottery to receive one of five of the, here we go, moon mission games from Project Astro. These are really excellent cooperative board games, um, and I think you would have a lot of fun with them. So um, you need to post those events events by September 15th to qualify. And I just checked, there are actually quite a few events being held on the October 8th, but many of them don't have the word moon in the title. So make sure to put the word moon in it. Currently, there are only seven events that qualify for this. So you'd have very good chances if you want to post an event with the word moon in it between October 1st and 15th. And that's pretty much all I've got. Back to you, Brian. Okay, and Vivian will be back uh, with us at the uh, a little bit later, and so stand by for that. And at the end of the question and answer period, we will have another giveaway of ASV's Total Skywatchers Manual, co-authored by our own Vivian White and David Prosper, who many of you know is our our uh, one of the people that's been coordinating the Night Sky Network. You might also notice that there's a chat window and a question and answer window. The chat window is for all of you to introduce yourselves to each other and for general chat, along with any technical issues that you might have during the webinar. The Q&A window is where you should submit your questions for our speakers. It will keep track of your questions and so that we'll know whether or not your questions have been answered or not. So please uh, put your name in there. If I have a question. <laughs> I'm sorry, Vivian, what? <laughs> I have a question. Actually, Cook Feldman asked a really good question. He asked if they had to post the events on the NSN or the International Observe the Moon website. I just wanted to let everybody know that if you post your events on the NSN website, they will automatically populate the International Observe the Moon website. And Andrea might be telling us more about that, but thanks, Cook, for asking the question. If you post your regular events like you regularly do on the Night Sky Network calendar, it will then populate the Inum um, uh, website. There you go. Just wanted to add that. Thanks. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. Thanks. So if we do have any problems during the webinar, um, please let us know through the group chat or send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. So I want to introduce our, our speakers. We have uh, two speakers with us tonight. Andrea Jones is the director of the International Observe the Moon Night, an annual worldwide celebration of lunar and planetary science and exploration. She is an education specialist with the Planetary Science Institute based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Jones conducts education and communications activities for planetary missions and programs, including the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover, and three teams in NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. Timothy Glotch is an associate professor in the Department of Geosciences at Stony Brook, where he's been since 2007. 
He completed his PhD in geosciences at Arizona State University in 2004. And I think a little bit ago, I accused you of uh, being from Tucson, and I apologize for that, Tim. Um, and he was a postdoc at Caltech from 2005-2007. His research is focused on using laboratory spectroscopic techniques and sophisticated light scattering models to enable more quantitative interpretation of spectroscopic data sets. Pretty, uh, pretty high-end stuff here. This is great. He has also received NASA Group Achievement Awards for his work with the Odyssey Themis and Mara Mini Test Instruments that have flown to Mars and on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Diviner Lunar Radiometer Experiment. He's a co-investigator on Diviner, which has been orbiting the moon since 2009. In 2012, he was awarded the National Science Foundation Early Career Award. He's the principal investigator of the $5.5 million remote in situ and synchrotron studies for science and exploration, the RISE-4 team, which he'll tell you a little bit more about here uh, in a little bit, which is part of NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute survey. So please welcome Andrea Jones and Timothy Glotch. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to go first. Uh, it's very nice uh, to be here and uh, to be speaking to you about, uh, about uh, RISE um, and the moon. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here and we'll get going. Let's see here. Um, so, okay, I'm sharing. Slideshow. Okay. So um, as Brian mentioned, RISE Oops. is one of the one of nine teams in NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. Uh, RISE uh, stands for Remote Institute and Synchrotron Studies for Science and Exploration. And uh, our goal, one of our main goals, is to uh, basically uh, pave the way for future uh, human exploration of the solar system uh, with NASA's current target bodies, uh, which include the moon, uh, near-Earth asteroids, and the moons of, uh, of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Within RISE, uh, we have four main um, kind of science themes or science categories uh, that we work on. Uh, the first we call Preparation for Exploration, Enabling Quantitative Remote Geochemical Analysis of Airless Bodies. This is essentially my bread and butter, the work that I do at Stony Brook, where we do detailed laboratory experiments and modeling to try to help us understand uh, in more detail, the data that is returned by uh, NASA's spacecraft that are orbiting the moon and uh, also studying um, uh, asteroids and, and Phobos and Deimos. Um, our second uh, theme we call Maximizing Exploration Opportunities, Development of Field Methods for Human Exploration. We have a large uh, team of scientists who work in the field where we're developing methods for future astronauts uh, to uh, do geologic field work on, um, on the moon and, and asteroids and Phobos and Deimos. Uh, we work with astronauts to develop uh, in situ analysis techniques uh, using sophisticated instrumentation and basically develop field metrics to kind of maximize the science return from uh, future field investigations um, on the moon and other bodies. Now, uh, our third, uh, our, our third uh, theme is, is pretty unique among the survey teams. We call this protecting our explorers, understanding how planetary surface environments impact human health. Uh, basically, if you uh, go to the moon or an asteroid or surface of Phobos and Deimos, the first thing you would notice is that it's really, really dusty. And that dust would get all over your spacesuit and eventually back into um, your spacecraft. And we want to understand how that dust, um, if inhaled, if, if, um, if, uh, if, interact, if you interact with it, breathe it in, gets on your skin, you know, how that would potentially impact um, your health. So we have uh, a series of studies designed to look at that. And then finally, our fourth theme is called Maximizing Science from Return Samples, Advanced Synchrotron, and STEM Analysis of Lunar and Primitive Materials. A synchrotron is a very large apparatus that accelerates electrons to something like 99.99% um, of the speed of light around a circle, um, and it makes really, really bright x-rays and infrared beams, and we can use that to study really small things. A STEM is a scanning transmission electron microscope, and we can image individual atoms with this. And so you can think of this theme four as using really, really big machines to look at really, really small things. And so I'll talk about each of these in a little detail. Uh, but first, I think it's useful to think about how we study the moon and which, what are the different ways we can study the moon and learn more about our nearest neighbor. Well, perhaps the most obvious way to study the moon is 
by sending people to the moon and looking at the rocks there while we're there. So, you know, you know this would we would call boots on the ground. We would send human field geologists to the moon uh, to look at the rocks, to try to interpret the geological history and learn more about how that portion of the moon formed and how it evolved over time. And RISE themes two and three, so our field methods and our, um, our health studies are directly relevant to how um, we would study the moon using kind of a boots on the ground technique. And you're, the image you're looking at is a picture of uh, Jack Schmidt, um, Apollo 17 astronaut, the only scientist uh, ever, go, ever to go to the moon, and um, he was a geologist. Well, we can also study um, lunar samples in the lab, and this is directly related to um, RISE theme four. Um, so we have um, meteorites that have come from the moon, so an impact on the moon launches a piece of lunar rock um, towards Earth. It, um, some of it will ablate in Earth's atmosphere, but a chunk of it will land on Earth, and we can uh, study the detailed geochemistry and trace elements to identify that rock as coming from the moon. And of course, we have also several hundred kilograms, about three, 300 or so kilograms of rocks uh, returned by the Apollo astronauts, where we know exactly where they came from, we know the geologic context, and we can study those in the lab to make inferences about um, the history of the moon. And so we can you do things like just um, um, look at rocks under a petrographic microscope, a tool of a geologist, where the different colored uh, uh, bits are different uh, minerals within a rock. Uh, we can use X-ray mapping uh, in a transmission, transmission electron microscope or another tool to map out elemental, elemental distributions as well. Um, here, um, the red spots um, are really high in the, mineral, uh, the element potassium, which can tell us something about uh, how that rock formed. So this is a really great way to study uh, rocks in the surface as well. Now, samples are really useful for learning a lot about a really small portion of the lunar surface. But if we want to get a global view, we have to, we necessarily have to use remote sensing. Um, and so we sent spacecraft uh, to orbit the moon, uh, a recent spacecraft, um, uh, a spacecraft that's still in orbit around the moon is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, uh, on the top left here, you actually see a uh, image, a false color image from the moon mineralogy mapper, which was on the Indian Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft. Uh, this was an American instrument um, led by Dr. Carly Peters at Brown University um, on that Indian spacecraft. And the different colors represent uh, different minerals or different compositions. Um, on the right here, you see a temperature map from the Diviner Lunar Radiometer Experiment. That is the instrument that I'm involved with um, that's on LRO. Um, this is a temperature map of the lunar south pole. And if you look at the scale bar, you'll notice that those purple areas right here in some of these craters, these are permanently shadowed craters that have likely not seen uh, the sun, they've not seen sunlight in something like four billion years or so. Uh, and those areas are the coldest measured areas in the solar system. They're colder, much colder than the surface of Pluto. Um, on this map, the scale bar goes down to about 25 Kelvin or 25 degrees above absolute zero. But we think we've measured temperatures as low as 12 or 15 degrees uh, above absolute zero on the lunar surface. And at that point, we're just measuring the results of lunar heat flow. So heat trying to escape from the center of the moon out through the surface. On the bottom left here, you actually see an amazing photo of the Apollo 12 landing site. Uh, here in the middle, this is uh, from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, which is basically our spy camera that's in orbit around the moon. And so you can see up their experiments and we can image that from orbit um, around the moon which is just amazing okay so let's talk a little bit about um, how we can use our oops how we can use our field techniques to um, further uh, our goal to uh, use boots on the ground geology to learn more about the moon so our goal is to maximize um, surface science effectiveness um, and um, sample collection focused on specific science questions. So um, when we go to the moon, we know from experience that human exploration missions, wherever we go, require really fast, low risk, comprehensive and quantitative assessments of samples to quickly inform astronauts about which samples to select. They can only bring so many kilograms of samples home, and so you don't wanna bring home 300 kilograms of all the same stuff. You wanna go out and find which rocks are most 
uh, interesting and will tell us the most about the geologic history of that sample. Um, so astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, before they um, uh, went to the moon, they underwent uh, comprehensive geologic field training, but they all had they all had a very limited time on the surface. And so we want to figure out how we can maximize that time on the surface and uh, perf and provide informed assessments of how to best document and high grade the samples. That is, select the best samples. We're also really interested in identifying how we could find radiation safe havens. And so, in the event of a uh, solar um, a solar flare or outburst where um, we might an astronaut's life might be in danger, we would want to know where we could identify things like caves and lava tubes that might provide shelter um, in the event of a, of a radiation emergency. And then we our, our big focus here really is uh, one of our fo big focuses is how to best incorporate instruments, scientific instruments that measure things like subsurface structure using radar and topography using global positioning system and things like that. So here's an example of how we might uh, try do a test to figure out um, how do we maximize our surface time. And so we have two of our team members, uh, Jacob Bleacher and Brent Gary. They're both geologists at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, they did a um, transect and they did a they did a hike on um, the 1971 um, or 1974 flow uh, at Kilauea, um, and the colored lines you're seeing are uh, their uh, handheld GPS traces. And so before they uh, went out to the field, they plotted a path that would uh, tell them, you know, maximize where they wanted to go and see their uh, interesting scientific plans. Um, and their, uh, plan, their plan distances uh, averaged 9.1 kilometers, but their planned path that they planned ahead of time was about 8.75 kilometers. And if you actually... Um, look at the ground covered if it's drawn as a plan at 6.7 kilometers. So what this tells us is that based on the remote sensing data, um, the, the two field geologists covered about 24% less distance in area than they expected to. Um, when they looked at how much they walked, though, they walked a lot more than they expected to. This is because when you actually get down on the surface, there's some areas that are uh -uh lava flows that are really rugged and spiky and, you know, basically glass shards on the surface that you want to avoid as much as possible. Um, and so you go around those. There might be other areas where there's vegetation. You're not going to have that problem on the moon, but we have that in Hawaii where you want to go around. And so even though you covered less area than expected, you actually walked about 26% more than expected. So this one study, um, and we're doing more to try to um, confirm this, suggests that kind of 25% is the magic number. That is, when we um, are designing our plans to try to uh, figure out how we're going to uh, traverse the moon or an asteroid surface and how much ground we're going to cover, um, we might walk more as much as more than 25% longer than the planned line and maybe cover about 25% less ground than expected. So once we can kind of start getting metrics like this, it really helps us plan uh, what we're going to do and, and, and how we're going to do it. Um, we also um, are very interested in the geologic aspects of um, of what we can do on volcanically active regions. Uh, so this is more relevant to the moon than asteroids. But we want to understand lava and placement styles, a tube fed or sheet fed. Um, and this has implications for identification of radiation safe havens. If a lava flow is identified, is identified to have formed from a tube and there's a lava tube on the subsurface, that might be something that's accessible as a radiation safe haven. Uh, we can also map uh, channel pathways using surface um, differentiated uh, differential um, GPS, and we can use ground penetrating radar um, to look at pre flow topography. What would the surface look like before the lava flow um, flowed over it? Um, in addition to these kind of topographic uh, questions, we can also, we're very interested in characterizing the mineralogy and the chemistry of the rocks and the rock coatings. This is kind of the science question that's near and dear to my heart. Um, how did those rocks get there? Uh, what was, what kind of uh, magma did those rocks come from? Um, and how, is the, how, how have those rocks been, potentially been altered um, over time? And then importantly, since we're very interested in remote sensing as well, how are those compositional variations um, that we see on the surface observed from, um, observed from orbit? Can we see all those compositional variations from orbit? And our lessons that we've learned so far, really, just to get to the punchline, are that we can see lots and lots of compositional variation on the ground that's really hard to see from orbit, usually just because our pixels are so big. With Diviner, um, uh, in orbit around the moon, our pixel size is about 250 meters uh, per pixel. And so any 
uh, compositional information we get from Diviner is at that scale. So it can be a lot, lot, lot of subsurface or subpixel compositional variation um, that we're that we're missing. Um, in 2015, uh, uh, so just uh, last summer, uh, we completed our second field campaign at the Kilauea 1974 flow in the Big Island of Hawaii. We actually just completed our uh, third um, our, our third field season uh, just last month as well. Uh, we used an infrared camera, uh, X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence, uh, LIDAR, which is basically a, a laser ranging system, and kite-based imaging and pro, uh, photogrammetry to study the region. Uh, we had a large uh, field crew that you can see here um, that included um, an astronaut uh, named Rick Mastracchio. Um, they completed one dry or practice run and two uh, simulated extravehicular activities um, and were assisted by the instrument science teams. I really, really, really want you to go to this website, uh, which is www.reportingrise.com. Uh, one of the really cool um, education and public outreach aspects of what we did was we uh, ran a uh, student science journalism class at Stony Brook University. And so the, uh, the semester before our field campaign, students learned all about what we were doing. They learned how to um, uh, talk to scientists and how to interact with scientists. And then we sent all those student journalists into the field to document um, our field campaign. Um, and they just put, a, put together some tremendous results. And so I encourage you to go uh, have a look at that. Now, we are in a national park, uh, so we weren't able to actually use uh, drones or um, uh, aerial vehicles to get a sense of the uh, detailed um, topography of the surface. So instead, we used kites because they're not drones. And so we had one of our collaborators, um, Stephen Scheidt, uh, who's uh, at the University of Arizona. He developed um, and has a patent pending on a kite-based uh, camera system that could produce really highly detailed topographic maps of the site. Uh, this detailed topographic map is 415 by 320 uh, meters across. It has a spatial resolution of something like three centimeters per pixel in the center of this digital terrain model. So this provides our scientists on the ground with all the detail they need to understand the topography and where the lava was flowing and when it and when it got there. This is just an amazing, amazing data set. Uh, we also, um, uh, Professor Deanne Rogers at Stony Brook University, she's developing a mid-infrared camera. Um, and this mid-infrared multispectral imagery provides um, some context uh, for other types of measurements and identifies surfaces for further, more detailed characterization. The image you see on the left is a visible camera image. It's kind of might be kind of hard, uh, even when you're there just looking at these rocks. This is kind of a grayish rock. This is kind of a more gray rock. There's not a whole lot of detail you can say about how different they are. When we make false color infrared images, though, using this camera, we see very big differences. We see these kind of greenish spots. We see these bright blue areas that happen to be volcanic ash. And we see these bright purple areas. It turns out these purple areas, even though they look like black lava rocks here, they have a very, very thin coating of uh, silica or SiO2 on the surfaces as a result of the interaction of the acid vapor uh, from the volcano with the rock surface. And so we wouldn't, without this infrared um, uh, camera, we wouldn't be able to tell that. So this is a type of instrument that could be really useful for helping us to high grade the rocks and choose uh, what types of rocks we'd want to take back if we brought one of these uh, samples or one of these types of instruments to the moon. So uh, theme three, if you remember, is we're calling Protect Our Explorers. And this is all based on the idea that future astronauts will be exposed to harsh environments with potentially harmful but unknown health effects. So we're doing a bunch of experiments to determine the reactivity and toxicity of lunar analog materials. And eventually, we're going to use actual lunar samples to and test them. So the main thing we're interested in is the generation of things called ROS, or reactive oxygen species. These are things like hydrogen peroxide, um, O2 radicals, and OH radicals. Um, inhalation um, is basically uh, the root cause of the lung disease silicosis. You can also think of things like uh, black lung disease and coal miners. You inhale these dust particles. They can get lost in your lungs, and then once those particles start interacting with your lung fluid, there's basically geochemistry that's happening uh, inside your body, and that's usually not good for your body. So uh, typically, uh, the way that this would work um, you know, on the, on the moon is that uh, you'd have a mechanical activation in process, something like um, uh, formation of ash from volcanic eruptions, uh, uh, impacts pulverizing. Um, on Earth, um, you'd think of like industrial sandblasting and mining operations forming really fine particles. In making really active uh, uh, high surface area surfaces. 
Um, and you can inhale that and then uh, bad things can start to happen. So on the moon, we have lots and lots and lots of dust. And so the upper regolith um, is something like 10 meters thick where the average grain size is about 70 microns. And that's not really inhalable, uh, but about 10 to 20% of that material is less than 20 micron grain size. And that is um, inhalable. And a decent portion of that 10 to 20% is actually less than 10 or less than even less than two micron grain sizes. And that can really get into your lungs and get, and get, lo uh, get, um, get lodged there. And so this is the type of material you have to worry about um, getting on a spacesuit and then eventually back into a spacecraft. Um, if you've ever been to, say, the Smithsonian uh, Air, National Air and Space Museum, they actually have some of the Apollo uh, spacesuits in, uh, you know, behind glass. And the first thing you notice is that these are not pristine white spacesuits. They are filthy. They're covered with really, really fine-grained gray dust. And that stuff ended up back in uh, the Apollo capsules. And the actual, um, and the um, astronaut, Apollo astronauts, um, uh, reported having kind of hay fever-like symptoms, uh, irritation in their lungs and sinuses. And this is just only from being on the surface of being exposed to this material for uh, matters of hours or, or days. If we have longer duration missions, we have to really worry about this and we have to have a really detailed understanding of, um, of how this material interacts with the human body. So here's an example of a type of test uh, we can do. Uh, uh, basically what you're looking at is um, uh, capsase 3 is a, uh, uh, it, it's a protein that forms when cells die um, and tubulin is just a, uh, that's, that's just kind of a control. And so what you can look at is we have um, all these different samples are different types of uh, lunar uh, regolith simulants. These are Earth samples, but they're made to look like or, or, or be like the moon. Anatase is a titanium dioxide that's control, and we have another control here. And what you should look at, think of graphically, is that the more black you see, the more cell death is occurring. So we can actually have a direct measure of toxicity of these materials by um, – uh, by interacting mouse uh, lung cell cultures uh, with, uh, with these materials. And so you can see this particular material and this particular material cause a lot of this black, which means there's a lot of this protein, which means it's killing a lot of cells. Whereas other materials like this one, um, and then you know, maybe this one and this one, uh, they are doing quite a bit uh, less damage. But we're still, this is still a progress. This is still a, a, a project that's in progress. We're working with our Department of uh, Pharmacology and our medical school at Stony Brook so we have geologists and doctors uh, working together uh, on this, which is pretty cool. Uh, we can also, um, so this is just another way of looking at this. Um, our mice, our mouse lung slices were treated overnight with this um, material, JSC uh, one, uh, 1A, 10 microns, or this anatase, this unreactive material. They stain the cells to show the presence of macrophages. Macrophages are cells that attack invading species, and so that would be, you know, our little dust particle. And what we see is that this JSC1A material, um, which is our lunar simulant, causes about three times more oxidative stress and cell death on lung cells than our control does. So if the moon is anything like this JSC1A, and this JSC1A is in fact made specifically to look like the moon, then this could potentially be a harmful material uh, for astronauts to be to interact with. Okay, so finally, I'm just gonna mention um, the last uh, bit of work that we're doing I uh, actually have uh, two more things to talk about. Um, so we're um, uh, maximizing science from return samples. And so this is a project set, set of projects we're just kind of getting underway. We're interested in measuring the oxygen content and major minor elements abundances of lunar meteorites and returned uh, Apollo samples. This tells us a lot about the, um, the geochemical environment uh, in which uh, these rocks formed. We're studying the structure of uh, material, lunar materials that have undergone a process called space weathering, and this is a result of the interaction of uh, the lunar surface with the space environment, the solar wind, micrometeoroid environment, um, cosmic rays, things like that. And then we're also really interested in technology development and developing new technologies to get really good science from basically nanograms of sample. Um, and for this work, we're utilizing um, the Brookhaven National Laboratory National Synchrotron Light Source 2. It's the brightest X-ray source in North America. It's brand new. Um, light source right down the road from Stony Brook University on Long Island. Um, and also we're working with the Naval uh, Research Laboratory using their uh, neon um, ultra stem, which can image individual atoms, which is pretty wild. So here's the scale of our uh, NSLS-2 beamline. So there's this ring, here's some cars for scale and this uh, mock rendering. And so we accelerate 
uh, electrons around this ring, that acceleration results in the um, uh, uh, um, emission of x-rays, and we can collect those x-rays and focus them down into really uh, tiny beams. And for that, we can, using that, we can study things like these uh, rims of individual lunar grains that have these little blebs of iron in them. We want to understand how that formed. Um, here's an uh, example of a neon um, ultrastem uh, ex uh, image of uh, graphene, which is a carbon, uh, single layer carbon. And you can notice this cool hexagonal structure. All these bright dots are, in fact, at carbon atoms. You might notice that that one bright dot right there is a little bit brighter than all the other ones. That's because that's a nitrogen atom instead of a carbon atom. And if this doesn't blow your mind, <laughs> I don't know what will. Um, Rhonda Stroud is our main collaborator here at um, Naval Research Laboratory. She's also looking at things like nanodiamonds and meteorites. And so this whole um, uh, thing you're seeing here is a nanodiamond that's just a few nanometers across. And these brighter spots are, um, are impurities within that diamond. As you know, I'm sure diamonds are composed of carbon, but they have impurities in them. This first atom here that's a little bit brighter is, is silicon. This other one is sulfur. Looking at the detailed impurities of, um, in these diamonds tells us how they formed and where they formed. Were they actually around before the solar system started, um, or are they a result of the condensation of our own solar nebula? That's something that Ron is looking at. Um, she's coined the term nanoastronomy, and she is our uh, nano astronomer on our team. So uh, finally, um, I'll mention some of the work that my, me and my students are doing. Uh, and this is our work that we call enabling quantitative remote analysis. And so we're doing a few uh, things here, um, a few separate projects. Um, I'll skip this slide and kind of get right into it. Uh, it turns out when we do infrared spectroscopy, uh, we have to be really careful of the environment that we're looking at. It turns out infrared spectroscopy on the moon is a lot different than infrared spectroscopy on Mars or on Earth. This squiggly line that you're, or the series of squiggly lines that you're seeing are um, infrared emissivity spectra. And basically the shape of the line and where you see these little divots and these, these maxima and emissivity, which is the y-axis, this tells you what the composition of the rock or mineral is you're looking at. And it turns out um, under the simulated, under lunar environments, these squiggly lines look a lot different than under kind of terrestrial and Martian environments. So in our lab at Stony Brook, we uh, built uh, a machine we call Parsec, which is the planetary and asteroid uh, regolith spectroscopy environmental chamber. Within that chamber, we recreate uh, the vacuum and temperature conditions that we see on the surface of the moon so we can acquire infrared spectra under simulated lunar conditions. In this um, uh, plot, just shows the, uh, how the spectra of a mineral called uh, pyroxene varies as a function of particle size. And so this is 100, the yellow is 120 micron particle sizes. This is 90 microns, 63 microns, and less than 60, 63 microns. And SLE stands for simulated lunar environment. We also use, as Brian said, uh, light scattering models to try to help us understand uh, how uh, surface texture um, can influence uh, infrared spectra. So um, in our computer simulation, these big red, these big black balls are made of quartz, which is SiO2. And same thing with these really little ones here. These are all quartz. And these kind of wave-like features are exactly, the, exactly what those are. Those are um, electromagnetic waves that are interacting with those surfaces. You might notice in this top picture that these waves are symmetric around these, um, these spheres or these circles. That's because these uh, particles, um, these simulated particles, are much larger than the wavelength of light uh, that we're using. Here, um, you might notice that there are these kind of weird light blobs, and the waves very close to these particles are not symmetric. That's because the particles are about or smaller than the wavelength of light that we're interested in. And here, you're seeing the result of that. When the particles are much larger than the particles, uh, than the wavelength of light, you get this nice, smooth spectrum. And when the particles are smaller, than the wavelength of light are about the same size. You get this kind of weird jaggedy spectrum. You don't have to be an infrared spectroscopist to tell us that to, to tell that these things are very different. Even though it's the exact same material, just the particle size and the texture can uh, really influence the the you know, the shape of the spectrum, which complicates our co compositional analysis. And so this is something we're working really hard to try to understand in more detail. 
And even though it is a very detailed kind of complex problem, it has profound result, profound implications for how we interpret uh, remote sensing data from the moon and other uh, bodies in the solar system. The last thing we're kind of looking at is this process called space weathering. And I'm just finishing up because I want to make sure Aunt Andrea has plenty of time uh, to talk about International Observe the Moon Night. Um, uh, space weathering is a combination of processes, including comminution, which is basically breaking up of particles from uh, micrometeoroid bombardment, vaporization due to impact, uh, interaction of cosmic and solar rays, sputtering and uh, of elements, and implantation with solar wind, which is mostly um, uh, mostly hydrogen um, particles um, or hydrogen atoms. And the result of space weathering are these uh, kind of uh, uh, large glassy uh, particles that we call agglutinates, uh, where larger particles are kind of uh, welded together uh, by glass. We also see the formation of uh, really uh, iron metal rich rims on all these grains. And so one of our goals is to simulate this process in the lab so we can learn more about it. We're using the tandem, tandem negative ion source at Brookhaven National Laboratory. We're radiating samples um, uh, at uh, 30, 50, and 100 kilo electron volts with um, hydrogen atoms to provide a range of penetration depths into the sample. We use specific doses and we monitor the samples uh, using visible near infrared spectroscopy and 100 nanometer scale um, X-ray absorption uh, spectroscopy, which is going to tell us a lot about the chemistry and structure of the materials after we do this experimental space weathering. And if we can get these experiments right, uh, it's been a, almost a two-year process to design these experiments and to really figure out exactly how we're going to do them, um, then we can learn a lot about how this process actually works on the moon and other um, airless bodies in the solar system. So just to summarize, uh, RISE uh, is a really broad-based research effort um, utilizing unique talents of something like 60 researchers, students, and educators. We're really invested in uh, training the next generation of solar system explorers. We have lots of postdoctoral researchers. We have lots of graduate students and undergraduate students all working uh, with us. Um, RISE um, also um, addresses each of the primary methods by which we can explore uh, the moon, um, the moons of Mars and near-Earth asteroids, and that's kind of boots on the ground geology, advanced laboratory analysis, and remote sensing platforms. Um, and each of these RISE themes is integrated with each other and with our um, detailed education and public outreach plan, and that's really Andrea's job. Um, she is our education public outreach uh, lead for, for RISE, and she, if, she can also answer more questions about that. And International Observe the Moon Night is one of the main outreach uh, things we do every year. So um, if you want to learn more, um, you can go to uh, this website here, uh, ris4e.labs.stonybrook.edu. This has details about our team members and a, a set of uh, blog posts uh, detail, detailing individual projects by some of our team members. Uh, reportingrise.com is, um, is our field uh, report uh, from our student journalists. We're on Twitter at ris4e underscore survey, and we're on Facebook here. So. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing, and um, thank you for listening. I'm going to turn it over to Andrea now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim. That was great. Um, and do you want to take questions now, or are you able to stay on later and take them at the end, or what would you like to do? Let's go ahead and have questions at the end, Andrea, and we'll go on with yours next. Okay, great. Um, then I will, let's see. This one. Okay. Can everyone see that? Hope so. Yep, you're on. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. So thanks so much, Tim. Um, we wanted to do this webinar together because International Observe the Moon Night um, is, you know, an exciting event, and we'll talk lots about, you know, all the different aspects and things that you can share, but. One of the great things to talk about is all of the science, and RISE has an example of all of these wonderful projects that are going on that if you would like to, you can share this with your visitors um, when they come to an International Observe the Moon Night event. Um, so we like to give people a science update and then say, hey, and here's an opportunity to share it, um, you know, both from RISE and from any other place that you might be getting your science information. 
So as has already been said, I am uh, the director of International Observe the Moon Night, uh, and I also work with RISE. It's my sincere privilege to do that and some other projects as well. And any one of those can fit into Observe the Moon Night because the moon is in everyone's backyard and everyone is connected to it. Well, let's see, how do I, okay. All right, so some inspirations for this event. If you have been doing this for a while, maybe you already know these things, and so I apologize if some of this is repeat, but if you're new, I wanted to, to let you know why we even got started with an event like this. And it started back in 2009 when the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar uh, L cross. You know, I actually can't even remember that uh, image. I have it written out in my slides, but I can't see the notes. So L cross, um, the lunar crater. Uh, anyway, um, these two two spacecraft were launched together, um, and they went up to the moon and they successfully made it into orbit. And this was a really exciting thing to get these spacecraft up to the moon very quickly. Um, LRO is right now today, as Tim said, orbiting the moon and collecting all kinds of amazing data. And LCROSS um, impacted one of the permanently shadowed regions, and you know for the first time was able to taste and, and touch some of the volatiles that we find in those really, really, really cold regions of the moon that, as Tim also said, haven't gotten sunlight for billions of years. Um, so we wanted to celebrate that. So we had events at NASA Ames and NASA Goddard, which is where our two um, missions were, were based. And there was such public interest in these events that we kept going. And we decided, OK, we're going to have National Observe the Moon Night. Um, but because of the International Year of Astronomy, because of you know lunar enthusiasts around the world, we never even had a National Observe the Moon Night right away it became International Observe the Moon Night. Um, and we have been going strong since 2010 with that. Um, within International Observe the Moon Night, we like to highlight both those science results that we're getting, um, but also the personal and cultural connections that we all have with the moon. So think about your language. If you say month or lunatic, or if you have a favorite song that features the moon, or you know a memory. I, I do uh, workshops for LRO, and I start off every week with, what's your favorite memory of the moon? And everybody has an answer to that question, and some of them are just wonderful. So we have these, these ties. Um, with our art, with our uh, science, um, and you know, this is something that the poets and the the painters can share in as well, and we certainly encourage that. As well as you know, stories. There's all kinds of wonderful you know Native American stories, all kinds of stories from early Europe and and anywhere in the world, um, because the moon is something that Native cultures could see for you know the entire time that we have been humans looking up in the sky, we've been able to see the moon. And um, this is a great time to talk about that. Um, we also highlight, you know, the moon's role in space exploration. So RISE is preparing for the next explorers, robotic and human explorers around the solar system. Um, the moon has played a really large role in that as, you know, it was already touched on, but you know, this is something that has helped us sort of step out outside of our, our backyard and into the beyond. And the moon has certainly been a key player in that. And so this is a chance to celebrate that heritage as well. Um, and I didn't want to go so much into science results in my portion of the time because Tim already gave you lots of great science, uh, but I did want to mention that if you're interested in the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, I put together a presentation that is available on the International Observe the Moon Night website that has lots of science results from the moon uh, from this mission, such as, you know, we found the coldest place in the solar system, even colder than Pluto that we've been able to measure. You know, we found pits, we found caves, we found, you know, um, you know evidence of recent volcanism that was amazing. New impact creators forming all the time. Um, all kinds of things are going on. So if you would like to learn more about that, and these kinds of things are, are put in this presentation, and you're welcome to use this or any of the other presentations that we have on our website to pull out snippets and, and share highlights with your visitors, should you be interested in doing that. Perhaps if you're not able to, you know, get an expert to come, or if you are the expert and you're able to put it together. But this is available. Um, on the, on the International Observe the Moon Night website. Um, so what is International Observe the Moon Night? 
It is an annual worldwide celebration of lunar and planetary science and exploration. Um, and that's the one day each year everyone on our whole planet is invited to unite and observe and learn about the moon um, and its connection to you know, our role in, in space exploration um, and to share those connections. So this is all sort of summarized. But um, as Vivian was saying, we understand that not everyone is available on the day that we plan it each year. So in the past, we have typically planned it in the fall, um, which is, you know, has been a pretty good time for a lot of the hosts that we've been working with. We are considering actually moving it to the spring based on some host feedback. Um, and we also always choose a phase of the moon that's visible um, in the late afternoon or evening because that's a time most hosts like to, to have their events. And we know that, you know, as amateur astronomers out there, you probably more, or I anyway, enjoy looking at a moon with a terminator so I can check out those wonderful regions um, with the, the shadow environment that's so pretty. And you don't get that on a full moon, um, although that's another great time to observe the moon. We, we encourage moon observation anytime, um, but that's why we pick our certain day. But if that's not a good day for you, then any time in that area, that's a better time for you and your community to get together. Uh, we encourage that. All right, so, oh, I forgot to mention, so the, the folks who sponsor uh, International Observer Moon Night, uh, primarily the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, but then RISE, for example, we all, all participate in this through the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, and all of the survey teams um, are involved on some level and, and host events and get involved. And the Lunar and Planetary Institute also puts in some funding specifically for our website. Um, but then we have a number of different partners, such as you all, your, your Night Sky Network, team is really wonderful and we know that you are really involved in this event and we appreciate that. Um, and then lots of other groups, uh, we work with Google Lunar X Prize, CosmoQuest, Science Festival Alliance, um, the NASA Discovery Program, um, we're with lots of different groups actually, but these are our main ones. Um, and right now we're getting some of this data in. So uh, in 2015 we had 545 registered events in 54 countries. Um, so far, we are, I think, up to 59 countries since 2010 and 49 U.S. states. So we're missing one of them. I have to find out which one that is and, and get it on the list. But definitely, it's great to see how this is spreading around. We also know that there are more events, for example, in Africa, uh, but folks can only register if they have internet connections and um, there are not a lot of internet connections in the Sahara area so others are hosting events there too this is just what we've had registered um, so some highlights so what are we trying to figure out about these events uh, international observer moon night events are really kind of neat because they're very flexible so anyone anywhere can host an event and everyone everywhere can see the moon um, with you have high technology or you know with technology with um, support such as telescopes or binoculars that's great but if you don't you can still see the moon so that's one of the great reasons uh, to celebrate this and to unite in a peaceful way to get everyone excited about space that's always you know that's the main goal of, of this whole program um, but we also uh, let you do what you think would be best for your community. So um, if you would like to just go out and look at the moon, that, that counts. We are happy to have you just go look at the moon. If you want to have a huge event with 10,000 people and have them all looking at telescopes everywhere and doing hands-on activities, that's great too. So it's really up to you what you think you are able to handle, um, perhaps with a partner, or what um, your community would be most interested in. All of those qualify. So that said, it's a little hard to evaluate you know individual events and we work individually with hosts if you would like a personalized um, evaluation of your event we can help with that um, and then you can use it to justify why you might be able to um, host similar events in the future if you have funders who would like that kind of information um, but some things we are able to see um, we know that tens of thousands of people participate every year in this event, so that's really exciting. Um, we know that there are so many different places that host events. We have you know, museums, science centers, um, planetariums, we have ice cream shops, we have some local bars that have blue moon specials. Um, we have, you know, weddings have actually been involved. Everyone went out and looked at the, the moon together. We have backyards um, around the world where people are looking up around uh, at the moon, so that's great. And they range in size, 
hugely. Um, most people do partner. So if you are looking to have an event and you're not so sure you want to deal with all the logistics or you'd like to have hands-on activities but you don't want to do them all or you just need more help, um, most of our our hosts actually work with you know an amateur astronomy group and a school or a library or a science center or some other group. Um, some even have multiple partners so we certainly encourage that and you might want to look into that. Um, we also have demonstrated that people learn about lunar science and exploration. Yay, that's great. Um, and that they want to learn more when they leave, which is also really exciting. Um, and we have data that, that actually demonstrates that people have a good time at these events, so that's wonderful. Um, so, item is a chance to share NASA science, get people excited about the moon and beyond, because we don't stop at the moon, look beyond. Um, OSIRIS REx is launching on September 8th, a month before International Observe the Moon Night, looking, um, and it's gonna be a sample return mission to an asteroid. That's really exciting. Go see if you can find the asteroid belt or, you know, some, you know, Jupiter, which is, you know, has an exciting mission right now, Juno. Um, so these are other things that you can look at when you're out there with your telescope um, and teach people about them. And this is just a chance also to, as we said, bring together your community, bring together partners and, and really connect with people around the world who are together looking up um, on that one day or near that day. Um, something we've also found is that our hosts use a lot of the stuff on our website. Um, so I know some of you already host events, which is wonderful. Um, but if you have not yet, or if you haven't really navigated through our website so much, I wanted to just point out some highlights to you that, you know, if seeing them might help you remember them to use them yourself. Um, so here we go. We have our map so far of events. Um, we're filling that in as we speak, so that's exciting. Um, we have, you know, lots of ways to get involved with International Observing Week. So everything from I want to host an event um, and registering that and finding partners and all of that, or I want to attend an event because if you are hosting an event and you want people to be able to come, you know, a person from your community can find out where it's going to be and, and all the event details so that people can come to your event. If you are, for example, a Girl Scout troop or a Boy Scout troop or, you know, a church group that wants a private event or something like that, um, you can also make them private um, and still register and show that you're part of this, you know, exciting global celebration, but not allow outside people to come to your event. So either one is possible. Um, you can also see what other people have done um, if you'd like some inspiration. Um, if you would like to host an event, we have some guidelines for you. Some of you are really good at hosting um, observing events, and this might not be something you even need to think about, but we have some people uh, that are new, new hosts, and so we wanna make sure that they are, are comfortable with having an event. Um, then we have lots of different materials. So we have save the date cards, we have event flyers that you can fill in with the information from your own event. We also have International Observe the Moon Night information sheets in case you or you know others are interested in finding out more details about this event, we have that. And all of these and all of the International Observe the Moon Night materials, uh, we're working on translating them into other languages because you know this is international and so far you know our team is English speakers, but we want to make this available and we know that people around the world are, are using our, our products and are translating them themselves, but we would like to make more of that available on our website. So that's underway. Um, if, if you'd like to find a partner, so a lot of um, a lot of you guys actually are on here. So the Night Sky Network um, from JPL is, is through here. Um, and we can also have the ASP search for clubs. So you might actually be contacted by people uh, from our website. So that would be pretty cool if any of you have had that experience uh, to let us know. Um, and then, you know, other ways to find clubs. We also have the NASA Speakers Bureau, um, Solar System Ambassadors, and others um, that can come help with your event should you uh, want extra support of that kind. Um, we always feature activities. We know that some of you have excellent activities that you're already using, and we certainly encourage you to do whatever you enjoy doing best, um, but we have some suggestions if you'd like them. Something we really like um, having people start at our events at Goddard and the ones that we help with are um, Muna Observation Journals. So it's great to get people out there, you know, for that one day, that's wonderful, but to actually, you know, pay attention to what the moon looks like 
throughout the whole month and see that cycle and find out that, you know, hey, it's out just as much during the day as it is at night. And wow, it's out at different times and, you know, rises and sets at different times. All of that, something that a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention to. So you can encourage them to, to really get to know their nearest neighbor in the sky uh, by starting a moon observation journal. And then we have some questions for consideration on the back of that. Um, we also have more hands-on activities featured on NASA Wavelength. If any of you, you know, have not heard of this resource before and you host events that do hands-on activities, I highly encourage you to look this up because um, this is a resource that has all of the NASA education um, products that have been reviewed by science and education um, experts, and they're great. So we have a list on this uh, website that we just updated, I should have put the updated slide on, um, that you can check out for some activities as well. Um, and then um, our moon maps, these are one of our most popular resources. Um, every year we have a moon map of the exact phase the moon will be in on International Observe the Moon Night that year on INOM. Um, and it has some information and some high resolution images on the back. Um, and then if you'd like to analyze them even more, you can go to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera website, which we have a link to this year um, to see them in even more detail and check out um, the context of the area. All right, in case you have stormy weather, we understand that there might be a problem, so uh, we have some resources that you can make use of or to decorate, you know, even if it's great weather. So the Moon as Art Gallery, some of our beautiful data. Um, we also have an exhibit at the Smithsonian, uh, the National Air and Space Museum here in DC right now, and you can explore um, these images that are just spectacular. I think it's like Ansel Adams of the Moon. It's just wonderful. Um, and if you'd like to check that out, you can do that or you can download them and print them and make them available you know, for your visitors to see as well. Um, there's also things like if you have a computer that you can set up or if you know your visitors are interested in learning more when they leave, things like NASA's lunar mapping and modeling portal are a way for people to really dive into data from the moon. Um, and then we have things like participating in lunar science research through CosmoQuest, a citizen science program that perhaps you have heard of, of and perhaps you're already involved in, but if not, it's a way that people around the world can actually contribute to, to science research that NASA is doing. Um, and Moon Mappers is part of that, and that uses LRO data. Um, and then there's lots of other things like our logo. You can download it and use it. Um, we have, you know, uh, bookmarks and posters and things like that. And we will actually be sending um, to uh, the Night Sky Network a packet of things that we'll let uh, Vivian and others distribute to people who are hosting events, so that would be great. We also have certificates of participation that you can fill in with your name or your, your group and say, hey, I did this. Um, and you know, last year we did a thing where we bounced all of the names of people who participated or all the event sites that participated off the moon in a radio moon bounce. So I don't know if we'll be able to do that this year, but we try to do something fun like that afterwards. And then of course, we have our host surveys to see how we can better serve you and what resources we can put on our website that can help you. And those participant surveys, we really like it when you share them with your visitors to give us data from the participant end, but also, again, they can be made available to you to help you uh, defend hosting events like this in the future. All right, so, We'd love for you to get involved, register your events, register through the Night Sky Network, um, that's fine, um, and that goes into our website. We'd love for you to evaluate your events so that we can find out, you know, how can we better serve you as an event host and what else can we provide? Um, and then we'd love for you to share pictures, share stories, share little things about your event through, you know, Observe the Moon Night um, social media or um, on our Flickr pages and other places. So we'd love to see what you're doing and, and please share and let others around the world see and see what they're doing too. That we have sometimes had like Twitter feeds up on our, our sites to show, hey, you're at this event here, but look at all these people in you know China and India and you know the West Coast, the East Coast, the, anywhere um, also looking at the moon with you. And so that's kind of a fun thing for you to be a part of that. All right, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that International Observe the Moon Night, or INOM, is on October 8th this year, but next year we will be doing it on July 15th, which is about five weeks before the total solar eclipse that will be crossing the United States that I am sure you all are fully 
aware of. Um, but we're going to be having some public offerings um, through our website, such as webinars to help people get prepared for the eclipse. Uh, we'll focus on lunar science that will affect the eclipse, such as the topography of the moon and how you know our understanding of the, the precise topography better than any other object in the whole solar system, including the Earth, um, we know that in such detail that we can actually um, adjust the eclipse map leading across the country and also you know know where the Bailey's beads will be and how you'll be able to view them um, because of you know our data from LRO. Um, so wanted to let you know about that and thank you all very much for your attention and for hearing about RISE, an example of science that you can share at International Observer the Moon Night and also for all of you who already participate in this event. Uh, we really appreciate it and we hope that you will continue with us. And so with that, I guess I'll stop sharing my screen, or should I leave it up? Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing, and then we'll be back to everybody's faces. Tim, are you still there? Oh, excellent. Yep. Okay, we have um, time for one quick question. I'm sorry, we are running out of time here, but um, David Kaninsky asked, uh, Tim mentioned DGPS with respect to Hawaii. Can we use that on the moon? With no... So, um, yeah, so if we wanted to use different DGPS stands for Differential Global Positioning System, and so it's essentially a 3D GPS that you can take out and map topography and, and make digital um, uh, terrain models, things like that. So if we wanted to do DGPS on the moon, we'd essentially have to have the infrastructure around the moon that we have around Earth. So we'd have to have um, several satellites in orbit around the moon that we could use to triangulate a position um, on the moon. Um, as well as the equipment on the ground that's operated by a field geologist. And so um, you might imagine that at some point um, a private company or NASA or European Space Agency or the Chinese uh, or the Indians might be interested in doing a detailed geologic work like this. Um, and if you, you know, it, it's a well-known uh, technology. Uh, it's nothing too complicated about it. So um, if you're, in, if a country or a corporation uh, invested in the infrastructure, then it could certainly be, uh, be usable on the lunar surface. Great. Excellent. So I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions tonight, everybody. I think I'm going to do the book giveaway unless, oh, Brian's here. Great. Go for it, Brian. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, that's all for tonight. This is, uh, this is great. So you can find this webinar along with many others on the Next Sky Network under the Outreach Resources section. Just search for webinar. We will post tonight's presentation on the Next Sky Network YouTube channel by the end of the week. You can also find other resources next Activities on this webinar's dedicated resource page. And now for our raffle, Vivian's going to count and determine this month's winner of the ASB's Total Sky Watchers Manual. Numbers entered before the signal won't count, and you can only enter a number once. We're going to make it a little more challenging this time. So the third person to correctly enter the following combination will win. So get ready, everyone. Number three. You're going to okay. win the right, Skywatchers manual. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> the third okay. person okay. that was. So the third person. So here's the combination. So get ready. M47. Uh oh. Okay. Mm, coming. Let's see. Well, that's a lot of answers. Let's see if I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're going so fast for me. Oh, we had one M47. The third one is Dylan Ma. Oh, Hi, congratulations, Dylan. I just want to say um, we'll, we'll send that out to you. Dylan, if we don't have your email um, already, please shoot us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. Congratulations to you. We'll send you a copy of the Total Sky Watchers Manual. And make sure that you include your mailing address so it will go to the right place. And thank you so much, Andrea and Tim. That was fantastic. Yeah. I cannot wait to hold an event for Inam. It's going to be a really fun night. Thanks very much, Vivian. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I had a lot of fun. And uh, we're really, really looking forward to doing an Inam event um, in Stony Brook uh, as well in the next month. Very cool. And speaking of next month, month, mark your calendars for our next webinar on Wednesday, September 21st, when we turn our attention to Saturn with NASA's Linda, Linda Spoker, who will share with us current findings from the Cassini mission, including the latest from Enceladus and plans for Cassini's last year 
of exploring the Saturn system. Keep looking up, and we'll see you next month. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. All right. Good night. Thanks.